Hey guys, on behalf of the congregation at Wayne Dale Baptist Church, I want to thank you for joining us online today. You know, I think we would all agree that life has really thrown us some new challenges and complicated questions recently. I'm happy to tell you that the Bible holds the answers to all of life's most complicated questions. So whether you're joining us Sunday morning, Sunday evening, or Wednesday evening, my prayer and hope for you is that whether it's the worship time or the preaching time, that you would be encouraged and helped. You know, in these difficult times, I'm always reminded of Jesus's powerful words in John chapter 10, verse 10. He said, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. So as a congregation, we're praying that it be true, that you would have life and have it abundantly. Be blessed.
Good evening, Wayne Baptist Church. 
I want to thank you for tuning in for our evening service tonight. It is Sunday, November 29th, just the Sunday after Thanksgiving 2020. I hope that you're blessed in the Lord and that you had a good afternoon and that you enjoyed the worship music that we included before the preaching service. I do want to encourage you to be at church this coming Wednesday. We, you know, if, uh, if it's God's will, and I pray it is, um, we will be getting back to our regular in-person worship services beginning Wednesday. So hope you'll come and be a part of the worship service at night. It has been a crazy time. I hope, as I mentioned, I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. I hope you had a good day today. We kicked off our Advent season this morning in the morning service. Kind of strange to do an Advent service from the pastor's living room. But uh, we'll do that more uh, formally beginning next Sunday. So I hope that you'll come be a part of that and you'll join us throughout the Advent season. Also want to just throw a shameless plug in there for our Wayne Dale family Christmas album that will take place uh, in place of our normally scheduled worship service on Sunday evening, December 13th. So that's just two weeks from tonight. So a lot of hard work has been put into that. Hope that you'll, um, hope that you'll come and be blessed. It's going to be a really neat time. I love I love what uh, the gifted people of our church do uh, in, in the Wayne Dale Family Christmas album. So it's just a good time. Hope you'll come and be a part of it. Tonight, I want uh, to speak to you from a book that I, I think I've only preached from one other time since I came to Wayne Dale Baptist. And that is the book of Job. Turn in your Bibles to Job chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 9 through 13. Now, if you know anything at all about the Bible, you know the story of Job, that, uh, that he was a righteous man, that God called him a righteous man, and that Satan came and asked for permission to, um, to tempt Job. And so all kinds of very, very, very difficult curses came upon Job. If you look at your Bible, um, before we even get to where we'll be reading, uh, Job is, is tested in the middle, beginning of the middle of chapter 1. Um, up to this point, his children have been killed, his wealth has been taken, and by the time we get to our passage in verse 9 of chapter 2, uh, the Bible says that he has been covered in boils from head to toe. So, Job is just going through a, in just an incredibly, immensely difficult time. Loss after loss after loss, test after test after test. Now, a lot of times, our tendency is that we say that, you know, when someone's going through a hard time like this, uh, you know, they must have done something wrong. They must have unrepentant sin in their life. But you know, Jesus said the just falls on, or the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. So, you know, our assumptions are off, often wrong when we see someone that's in the middle of a difficult time. There's, there are many people, even within Christianity, that believe that that uh, that difficulties like this that um, Anxiety, depression, emotional problems, um, you, you know, bad things that happen in life, they're always a result of sin. But that's not true. The Bible never teaches that. In fact, the story of Job teaches exactly the contrary. Because he was a righteous man, yet Satan still tested him, and God allowed it. In his providence and sovereignty, God allowed it to happen. So tonight's sermon title is Grief. How to help when you feel helpless. I wanted to talk about this tonight because this is one of the questions that I hear most often. Um, Pastor, how do I help my friend who has lost their spouse or who has a child that has an addiction? Or how do I um, help my friend who was just recently diagnosed with a terminal cancer 
what you know what do we do when the foundations are shaken and there's even a correlation between this and you know kind of some of the hardships that we're facing right now as a society lots and lots and lots of hurting people that's something that we need to be mindful of in the holiday season while it is the most wonderful time of the year and while it is a time of rejoicing and celebration for many people these this is the most difficult time of the year in that you know they have they have bad memories of some some difficulty or some hardship or some heartache that they faced earlier in life not everybody comes from a functional healthy family like many of us do uh, many, many people have lost loved ones during the holidays uh, even my dad died early in the afternoon on christmas day six years ago so you know though the holidays are a wonderful wonderful time my favorite no doubt my favorite time of the year it's not it's not always the time of of um of rejoicing and celebration and fellowship and goodness that we always think it is so i hear people say pastor how, how do i help people what 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 do you say when someone's going through a hard time we we'll deal with some of those things tonight uh, what what do we do as a society when we see so many people around us that are really hurting what what's the right approach to that our church is, is no stranger to death and brokenness and heartache. And, um, and that's not stopping now. You know, as we continue to venture forward as a church family, we'll continue to see people um, pass from this life into the next one. We'll continue to see people have, you know, a fatal terminal diagnosis. We'll continue to see marriages that fail we'll continue to see children that are rebellious so so grief and heartache and mourning how do we handle that well the story of job tells us much about that let's say a word of prayer and then we'll get to the sermon father we thank you for this day or we thank you for this morning and the celebration that we had even though we we're not able to meet corporately we do thank you for what you do for us and amongst us. Lord, I thank you for Waynedale Baptist Church and for the people of it. And I pray even now, Lord, that you'd bless them. Lord, as we break the bread of life tonight, I pray you'd speak to us. Teach us, Father. Um, teach us your will. Teach us your way as we look at the story of Job. Help us to be the kind of people that can really come alongside and be, and be a blessing and a help and an encouragement. Help us to be a balm to people who are really hurting, especially uh, during these difficult days that we live in. Lord, speak to us now by your Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. So in Job chapter 2, beginning at verse 9, this is what the word of the Lord says. Now I'll just point out to you that I've got some, some certain words highlighted. These words may be a little bit different depending on what translation of the Bible you're using, but I highlighted these words because they're very relevant to some of the points that we'll be making in the sermon. Here's what the Word of God says. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speak. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity that had come upon him, they came, each one from his own place, Eliphaz the Timonite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Naamathite. And they made an appointment together to come to sympathize with him and comfort him. And when they lifted up their eyes at a distance and did not recognize him, they raised their voices and wept. And each of them tore his robe and they threw dust over their heads toward the sky. Then they sat down on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights with no one speaking a word to him, for they saw that his pain was very great. So as we consider the topic, grief, how to help when you feel helpless, the story of Job is a remarkable example as we've already said, if we were to look at the text, um, pardon me, I didn't move the slide forward as I was reading, I'm sorry. 
as we look at the text and we just consider what all Job's gone through, you know, the loss of his, his home, the loss of his children, the loss of his agricultural um, property, and now the loss of his health. He's covered from head to toe in boils. And the scholars tell us that, that Job was a very respected man in his society, in his, um, in his town. He was a very successful businessman. He had real possessions. He had a beautiful family that was close, and he, has, he had children that, were, that loved God. And all these things systematically are just stripped away from him. And right before you get to, to really the heart of our passage, there at the very beginning in verses 9 and 10, we see that Job's wife um, encourages him to just give up, throw in the towel, curse God and die. Turn from all of your convictions and just surrender. But Job, because of his high moral and spiritual character, um, rebuked her. And he said, you know, how, how, how can we accept the good things from God and not also take the adversity? You're speaking as a foolish woman. So, so here... Job was in, in the midst of just real, I mean, just pressing, incredibly difficult time. A difficult time like I can only imagine. I've never faced that kind of adversity, that kind of hardship in my life. And I, I think I can speak for you and say the same. But his, his, his wife encourages him just to give up. So here's this man, he's under all the stresses and the strains and the heartache of losing his children and his wealth and now his health. He needs a friend. He needs someone to come along and be a blessing and speak words of truth and goodness to him. But his wife does just the opposite. She basically just pushes him to wrath and destruction. But then, but then Job's three friends come along, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Naamathite. Now, Ordinarily, when we talk about Job's friends, we criticize them for, for what ultimately becomes their, their wrongful uh, cursing of Job, their wrongful accusation of Job, their, their wrongful assassination of his character. But, but if all you consider is the beginning of the story, he, here was Job down in a, in a ditch, really hurting in the deep in the throes of grief, these three friends at the beginning of the story are a tremendous, tremendous help. And really, they form for us the model of how to help someone when they're grieving. So there are seven uh, real quick points I want to point out to you from the passage that we see these three friends of Job speak into Job's life and become a help to it. So number one, as we look at the story of Job and his friends, Job deep in the throes of hardship and grief and mourning, the very first thing that his friends show us that in the way of being an, exam being an example of how to help people that are in the throes of grief, number one, they were near enough to hear. If you look at the text, back there in... Verse 11, it says, Now when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity that had come upon him, they came, each one, from his own place. The thing I want to point out to you is when someone is in the throes of difficulty and hardship and grief and mourning, loss, suffering, it's very important that they have people around them that they are still connected enough with that when destruction or difficulty comes into their life, these people are close enough to take notice. Let me give you an example. I, I'm at the stage of my life now as a 50-year-old where many, many, many years have passed since I was daily with my childhood friends. When difficulty came to my life six years ago, when my dad was diagnosed with terminal cancer and then over just the course of a few months passed away, there were very few people that I was still in contact with from earlier in my life that 
could come to be a help and an encouragement to me during that season. I, I think that most of us that will be listening to this sermon, most of you will agree that w most of us are at the place in life now where we don't have a huge uh, network of friends. We don't have a, a big net of close acquaintances. But, but when Job came into this difficult time, he still had people in his life that were connected enough to him, that, that, were, that were intimate enough, near enough to his life that they, they were able to hear about the difficulty that had come to Job's life. So if we're, as, as the people of God, if we're gonna be a real help to people when they're in times of grief, we have to be connected to them. Very seldom do we get the opportunity to minister, to love and encourage and console someone who is a stranger. So, so this is a proof text and a good reason why we ought to keep friends. We ought to, we, we ought to endeavor to have intimate connections with people, to know them well enough that when trouble comes to their life, we're close enough we can hear it and see it. You know, um, the, the world with technology supposedly uh, making the world smaller and smaller and smaller, uh, the truth of it is we're becoming more and more and more isolated. We, we, more than ever, we stay home and stare at our screens all day long and never really make real human connection anymore. So in the days that are ahead for us as a society, we're going to see more and more and more in the days to come that when people enter into the stages of their life that are, that are most characteristic of times of loss and suffering and sorrow, we're going to find that they don't have human connection that can come to their aid. But when Job's friends heard that he was in a difficult time, they heard that they were near. They, they were proximal enough that they were aware of what was going on and they were able now to respond. You can have um, you can have you can have very close relationships, but if they're not a part of your daily or weekly or monthly life, they're not going to be able to come and help you in your time of need. Same for you. If you're not connected to your family and your friends or even your neighbor, if you don't have a relationship with them, if you're not near enough to know when they have times of suffering or difficulty, how could you possibly go to their aid? So Job's three friends, though later on in the story, they make plenty of mistakes. Right now they're being a blessing. And the first thing they do was they were close enough to hear. They were close enough to hear. In order to help a friend, you have to stay connected with them and know what is going on in their life. Number two, we see that Job's friends, they came to Job. They, they didn't just sit around and talk about it. The Bible says in verse 11, now when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity that had come upon him, they came, each one from his own place. You know, I've been around long enough and in Christian ministry long enough to know that there's no greater blessing to a person who is suffering, a person who is experiencing grief, than when his friends come to their side. You know, Andrea and I, I don't, I don't mean this in any sort of prideful or um, arrogant sort of way at all, but she and I have always tried to um, to make it to where people are when they're hurting. You know, as a pastor, that's kind of expected of me that when someone from the congregation is experiencing difficulty or grief or mourning, they want their pastor there. So, you know, over the years, I've spent a lot of time at the hospital, spent a lot of time at the funeral parlor, uh, spent a lot of time at kitchen tables over cups of coffee uh, during times of real sincere heartache. We, you know, we've, we've just always tried to make the effort to, to make it to the funeral, to, to be there at the hospital, to send flowers when we can, send, uh, send a little handwritten note whenever time allows. Just because we've realized that when you're going through a hardship, there's nothing like someone being there for you.
So, so Job's friends, again, they made many mistakes. They were near enough to hear. Secondly, when there was a need, when their friend needed them, they came to his aid. They didn't just talk about it. They didn't just get on social media and make a Facebook post about it. They didn't just call each other and, um, you know, simply exchange the facts. They went to where Job was. So if you're asking the question, Pastor, what do I do to help people when they're in the midst of grief? One of the, one of the best pieces of advice I could give you is don't just talk about being a blessing. Don't just talk about helping them go to where they're at. There's nothing, there's nothing like your presence. The third thing is they coordinated their efforts. If you turn back to the passage in verse number 12, no, verse number 11, it says, um, it, it mentions each, one, each of them, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, it says, then they made an appointment together to come, sympathize with him, and comfort him. And I just want to simply point out to you that they coordinated their efforts. We do this as a church. When we hear that one of our members has experienced a loss, our deacons get together and they coordinate how they're going to help. Our hospitality people get together and they talk about, you know, um, all the things. Um, making, making a little basket of goodies to take to the hospital to you know, just to put a little, a little something in the stomachs of the family members that have been hanging out there. Uh, they send flowers, they make funeral dinners up and all these things. They coordinate their efforts. They, they, didn't, they didn't just go to Job as individual friends. They came together to figure out how they could best minister to their friend. They all had different talents. They all had different resources. They all had different availability. So they got together. The Bible really uses the word made an appointment. They made an appointment together to come to sympathize with him and comfort him. You know, you're probably picking up on a theme in what I'm saying, and that is that my experience is that usually when, when people know of someone, an, a family member, an old friend, a, a fellow church member that has grief, that you know, they've had some loss, they're, you know, they're in the middle of turmoil. Most of the time, the church Lord Jesus is very guilty about this. Most of the time, we just talk about what we could do or we talk about how we might help rather than actually doing it. That's not... At, when you look at these first three points, that's not the case with Job's friends. They were near, they came, and they coordinated their efforts. All very, very, very important things. Number four, they sympathized emotionally. If you look at verse 12, it says, When they lifted up their eyes at a distance and did not recognize him, they raised their voices and wept. So here's how the story goes. These three men come together. They begin to make the journey to, to where Job is. And as they approach, they see Job, but he is so disfigured from the, the physical lament that he's in, covered with boils, that they didn't even recognize him as their old friend. Now, without even considering the loss of his agricultural resources and property, the loss of his home, the loss of his children, essentially the disenfranchisement of his wife, not even counting those things. When they looked at their friend and saw the condition that he was in, the Bible says what? They raised their voices and wept. Sometimes when we're with people that are really hurting, we feel a duty to be stoic. We feel like we've got to be strong to help them be strong. We feel like we have to be an example of what it is to be kind of deadpan, you know, to not let our emotions show. However, that's generally not beneficial. Here Job was in the midst of, of an incredible hardship 
his friends, these men, real men, says they raised their voices and wept. You know, I'll use another personal example. Um, when our niece, Katie, died, the day of her funeral, there's, there's an old friend of mine, I won't mention his name, old friend of mine, he and I, though we don't see each other much these days, we have a deep mutual love and respect for each other. And the visitation part had been going on, but there was just, I just had such a heaviness in my heart because of the situation. And uh, I was sitting there and it was coming near to the end of the visitation time. And he walks to the front of the sanctuary. It's the first time I had seen him in seven, eight months, maybe a year. I'm not sure. And, you know, immediately when I, when I saw him, uh, I stood from my seat and we threw our arms around each other. And he immediately just broke into such a heartfelt sob. And th this is a manly man. I mean, this, this is a real man. But as we embraced each other, he, he just began to identify with our hurt. He, he's, he's a wonderful guy, but I was really taken back when he responded so strongly. Just, I, I could feel the warm tears stream down his face and then touch my face and then drip from my jaw to my sport coat. Just tear after tear after tear after tear. And there was something about that that meant so much to me. I don't think I'll ever forget how much it meant to me to see him mourn with our family, to see him so deeply moved that he put himself in our place. And we... We stood there and embraced tightly. And, and you know how it is when you get to crying, you kind of, you almost hyperventilate and he's gasping for air. And now he's got me upset and I'm gasping for air. And we're both crying. But he and I, at that moment, we were perfectly together. We, we were, there was no separation between he and I, emotionally. I felt like someone was sympathizing and empathizing with me. He didn't say a word. I didn't say a word. We embraced and we wept together. A common lament. It touched my heart deeply. I was never, I will never, ever, ever forget that time that he and I wept over the loss of this beautiful person together. So, so touching. To this very moment, it still comforts me to know that at that moment in time, I was not alone. Job was not alone. They sympathized emotionally. Now, when, when we're walking with someone that's grieving, it, it is important that the emotions that we show, that they're appropriate, that, that they're not, you know, that they're, that they're the right emotion for the situation. If, if we display emotion that is not appropriate for the situation, then actually what we'll do is lure the person that is grieving, who, the, who we are there to support, we'll lure them into an erroneous perspective or attitude about their loss. So when we display emotion and sympathy, it needs to be appropriate. And, and Job's friends did that. What, what's it say? It said, they lifted up their eyes at a distance, did not recognize him. They raised their voices and wept. Something about sympathy and empathy. Number five, they exhibited solidarity. Midway through verse 12, after they raised their voices and wept, the Bible says, and each of them tore his robe and threw dust over their heads towards the sky. This was a common ancient response to lament. 
in in ancient times it was it was common and accepted for people who were in travail to tear their clothing and throw ashes on their head it was it was a symbol of being brought low well job's friends hadn't had loss they hadn't lost anything personally but their friend had. And so rather than leave him independent by himself, they join in. They, they, they identify deeply with Job in his own personal lament. They showed solidarity. They were unified in spirit and appearance with their friend, and they were not embarrassed. And what a, what a powerful thing. When my dad was dying, when we first received his diagnosis, and, and my dad was, a, was not a guy that showed a lot of outward emotion. When, when he first came home to go under hospice care, he was not afraid of dying, but he was afraid of how he might die. He didn't, want, he didn't want the end of his life to be characterized with horrific pain. And, um, and I was his, his uh, trusted confidant in that. He shared that with me. And I, I, I said, Dad, what, how, how can I best help you, serve you, bless you, walk with you during this time? Of, of real grief. And he shared some things with me that are too private to even say now. But I, I, made it, I made it my life's work. At that time, I made it my life's work to honor my dad's wishes. And th those things are between he and I. Not another living soul knows you know, the specifics of that. But it, was, it became so important to me to, to journey with my dad in that, to be with him, to support him, to, to, to have perfect solidarity with him. I would have done anything within my power to honor his wishes. Well, so it was with Job and his friends that, you know, they, they were near, they came, they coordinated their efforts, they sympathized emotionally, and then they locked arms with Job. If you look at the passage, it really is remarkable. When they lifted up their eyes at a distance and did not recognize him, they raised their voices and wept. And each of them tore his robe and threw dust over their heads toward the sky. These men wanted their friend Job to know that they were with him, regardless of the outcome. What a blessing it is to know when you're in a tight spot like Job is here for people to come along without question and lock arms with you. Many times there's so little that we can do to help someone that's really grieving. It's very, very, very important that when opportunities present themselves that we do what we can. This is one of those things that Job's friends could do. They come along and they lamented with their friend. Number six, they stayed. Simply, verse 13, then they sat down on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights with no one speaking a word to him. Seven days and seven nights. You know, sometimes it is appropriate when we're walking with someone that's grieving, when we're trying to bless and help and encourage someone that's in a season of mourning. Sometimes a short visit is appropriate. Many, many, many times that's the case. But it's also true that oftentimes when people are really grieving, when they're really struggling, for long periods of time, they're all alone. They're all alone. They, you know, we're there. I'll give you a perfect for instance. Say, say a church family loses um, the mother or father, the matriarch or patriarch of the family. Church members come along 
and we're there for uh, the visitation and we're there for the funeral and we're there for the funeral dinner and we we hug their neck and we say hey if you need anything don't hesitate to call me i, I really i want to help you you just got to let me know and then we disappear and we don't ever circle back to bless and help and check in so what happens is the person that's grieving is left to do that all alone think of um Think of widows who have lost their husband. You know, those nights at home alone are incredibly, just incredibly lonely. What if they had a friend like Job did that would come and just stay? They would just come and stay. What a blessing it was. These men came and they, they not only... Not only were they friends enough to be close to know when Job was struggling, not only were they friends enough to, to, make the, to make the trek to be there at Job's side, not only did they lament and weep with him, but they were willing to sacrifice the time to really show their empathy. They were willing to chisel out the time in their life to really support Job. Now, eventually, as the story goes, in the case of these three guys, they probably overstay their welcome. The longer they stay, the less productive their ministry to Job is. But here it is. It says they went seven days and seven nights and didn't even say a word. Seven days and seven nights, and all they did was sit there. There's something just so powerful, so powerful about a person's presence. Now, I want to couple that with the last one, it says that they were quiet. There at the end of verse 13, it says, Then they sat down on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights, with no one speaking a word to him, for they saw that his pain was very great. Now, here, here's, here's what I want to say. If you, if you don't get anything else from this sermon but this, that'll be enough. That, that'll, that's worth the price of admission. <laughs> So often, when, when we are relating to someone that has a problem, a heartache, a sorrow, you know, a, a rebellious child, a broken marriage, they, they, want, they want us to press into their life, but they don't necessarily want us to solve all their problems. They don't necessarily want us to try to explain away why everything happens. So often when we're ministering to someone that has a heartache, we say things like this. Well, God never makes mistakes. And, and that's true. God doesn't make mistakes. But at that moment, it's not really helpful. We say, well, God needed another angel up in heaven. No, that's just flat out not true. It's not helpful. When we have someone that, that, has, that ha hasn't necessarily had a loss, but they're in the middle of a problem, we, we try to offer all these solutions. And there may be an appropriate time for offering advice, but what your friend really needs is not so much your advice. They don't need a bunch of new doctrine to help them understand why God does what he does. What they need is a friend. So when people say to me, Pastor, this friend of mine, this family member of mine, they, they've just lost their husband, their wife, their son or their daughter overdosed. And, you know, I want to be a help to them, but I don't know what to say. Here's, here's what I say virtually every time. Oh, that's fine. Just don't say anything. You don't have to say anything. They, they didn't call you to be their counselor, probably. They probably didn't call you to be the shell answer man. They, they probably didn't call you because they thought you had a magic wand that could make all their issues go away. The reason they called you was they wanted someone, a kindred heart, that would just come and be a human being with them. I think, I think some of the greatest ministry that God has ever allowed me to do is to sit and say nothing. 
to have tender eyes, a compassionate pat on the back, hug around the shoulder, and to not try to solve any problems. I, I think, and I'm, I'm fighting back tears right now just even talking about it. I think some of the some of the best work that God has allowed me to do this side of heaven is to simply go and be a human with people that are hurting, to sit and to listen, to smile gently when it's appropriate, to allow my own self to weep when it's appropriate, to run and get their kids from school, to stop by Kentucky Fried Chicken and pick them up a bucket of chicken, to mow their yard, um, to pick up their mail, whatever. Some, some of the greatest work I've done. And you know, I'm, I hope you'll pardon the expression, but I'm a professional talker. Yet some of the best work that God's ever allowed me to do is just to sit and be silent, but to be present, to weep with them when they weep, to, to recall sweet memories when it's time for that and laugh at their stories and really not, not resolve any of their issues, but to just be present, to empathize and to sympathize, to be a warm hand on their face. You know, because we all have these things, you know, we're, we all lose our parents. Some of us will lose our children. What a heartache. Some of us will lose jobs and lose marriages. And some of us will watch our bodies fall apart. Some of us will lose our minds as we age. And when those things happen, what Time and time again, what I see people really wanting is they want somebody to come and be a human being with them. Nothing more, nothing less. So number six and number seven really get to the heart of the questions I wanted to answer tonight. Pastor, what do I do when someone I know, someone I love is experiencing grief? Here's what I've learned, and God has just shown me this through a couple decades of pastoral ministry, that is this, be there, go. Just stop what you're doing. You can afford to lose a little bit of pay at work. Um, you can, you can, your, your lawn can wait until tomorrow to be mowed. Go to where they are. There's no substitute for your presence. When someone's life seems to be crumbling in front of them, there's nothing like the presence of a friend. So, so go. And number two, don't say anything if you can't say anything helpful. There are some problems in life that you or I just can't make go away. You know, heartache, sometimes it has to just run its course. It's kind of like this virus. You know, once you get it, it has to run its course. Well, so is grief. Once you get it, it has to play out. There, sometimes there aren't shortcuts. Sometimes there are no uh, there there are no antidotes. There are no bypasses, no hacks for grief, and so you got to go, and you have to be willing to spend the time. So oftentimes we get so consumed in our own life that we want to help, but we don't want to really sacrifice. Number three. Do something tangible. Maybe you can't solve their grief problem, but you can solve their hunger problem. When you know someone that is heartbroken, they're grieving, you'd be amazed what $30 at the grocery store buying, buying a couple of um, chickens, rotisserie chickens and some potato salad and a couple of two liters of pop will do. In fact, this summer when, when our family was grieving the loss of Katie Jo, some of Andrea's workmates um, put together just, just a kind of a hodgepodge of food and they brought it to, to the church, to Waynedale Baptist. And um, our family and um, Katie Jo's family on the other side, we, we all came together. We ate a bunch of chicken and potato salad and drank some Diet Coke. 
and we were just together and our bellies were full and it was magic. So oftentimes when we hear about people that are grieving and struggling, we talk about wanting to help them, but we say, oh, I don't know how to help them. You, you may not be able to deal with the grief part, but you can deal with the practical parts. You can go mow their yard. You, you can buy them some food. You can just go pick up their kids and take their kids on uh, a little adventure so that they don't have to worry about entertaining their kids in the midst of their grief. So often, we don't know what to do, so we don't do anything. And that's the worst thing we could do. I want to tell you a story, and then we'll wrap up. Many years ago, probably about 20 years ago, maybe a little bit more, um, we were members at... Uh, Sunny Crest Baptist Church in Marion, and, and there was a, a couple, actually an entire family in that church um, by the name of Larry and Libby Brooks. They were beautiful, beautiful souls. Everybody loved them. Larry was a great big guy, um, you know, like my dad's age, maybe a wee bit younger. And uh, just a great big guy, strapping guy, worked at uh, the Chrysler plant over in Kokomo. And he had, I think, three boys that were about my age. I think one was, one was older, one was my age, and one was younger. And two of the boys were, were really faithful to the Lord, and one was not. And he had the one that was not had some physical ailments, and he just, he just struggled his whole life, was just hard. Well, as is sometimes the case, he could not be swayed out of his anxiety and depression, and he ultimately took his own life. And it was a horribly sad time for the Brooks family and the entire church, and it was a big church. We, we were all just heartbroken for them. We could only imagine the horror of losing a child, especially in that, in that manner, we all would have done anything, but we didn't know what to do, so we did nothing. That entire church, I mean, we went to the funeral, we told them we loved them, we told them we were going to pray for them, we tried to explain that God would make everything beautiful in its own time, and then we did nothing. When Larry and Libby would pass us in the hallway there at the church, because we didn't know what to say or what to do. Now, I'm not just talking about a couple of people, I'm talking about hundreds of people, because no one knew what to say or what to do. We didn't say anything. When Larry and Libby passed by, we would kind of look at the floor because we didn't know what to say to help them in their pain. We didn't know how to come to them like Job's friends did. And just sit. We we didn't we didn't understand this. And a couple years passed by, and ultimately they left the church. They they were not mad, but they felt the elephant in the room the same as we did. That they they understood that we didn't know what to say to them, and they felt like they needed to leave the church to get a fresh start. And I think they were probably right. I think they did the right thing as much as I hate to say it. So I have so many things swimming around in my head, but here's my encouragement to you. You don't know how to help people that are grieving. I have good news. There are some things that only Jesus can do. So you're off the hook on that, but you do still have some responsibilities. There are some things that you can do. You can do practical things. Don't just talk about doing practical things. Actually do them. Make an apple pie. Everybody loves apple pie even people that are grieving like apple pie. Make them a big meal and, and like just go above and beyond. Spoil them, lavish them in love. Be willing to go and sit for hours and say nothing. But you got to understand that your presence, just being there is like a medicine to a broken heart. <sighs> these, these seven things really are so insightful. They were near enough to know when their friend needed help. They, they stopped what they were doing and they went. 
they didn't just do it arbitrarily. They worked together as a team to make sure they covered all the bases. They were willing to sympathize, even the men. They were willing to weep with their friend. They exhibited solidarity. They said, look, Job, we're on your team. You can count on us. So much so that, that we're willing to, you know, we're willing to tear our own clothing and, and throw ashes on our head to prove it, that we're for you. We're not against you, and we're not even idle. We're, we're for you. And then they stayed seven days, seven nights, never said a word. They, they, uh, they didn't check on their own properties, their own business ventures. They didn't check on their own families. They sat in solidarity. Man, there's something magical about that. When someone will come and sit and just be a human with you. So, so powerful. Number seven, they were quiet. They were quiet until they weren't quiet anymore. And now the whole world knows that they should have stayed quiet. They, they passed some judgment on Job that was not right. And it caused Job more problems in the end than it should have. But they started out right. They started out just by being Job's friend, supporting him, being present, sharing in his grief and heartache. So grief is a funny thing. Uh, we, we often feel helpless, that there's nothing we can really do. Job's friends prove us wrong. I hope these things are helped to you. Next time you're grieving or you love someone that's grieving, I hope these things, by God, will be a help to you as you minister to them. Father, we love you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the truth of the scriptures. Lord, it's been a long time since we dug around in the book of Job. And I just thank you for these very practical lessons that we learn from four or five verses here in Job chapter two. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be people that can really journey and help and bless and... Well, whether it was the preaching of God's word or the worship time, I hope that the service was a blessing to you. Thanks again for tuning us in. I did want to share with you uh, just an encouragement for you to connect with Wayndale Baptist Church through your social media platform of choice, whether it's Instagram or Facebook, YouTube, whatever it may be. You can also learn more about the church at the church's website. That's waynedalebaptistchurch.org. And there's lots of things you can learn there about us. I would be remiss though, if I didn't take the opportunity just to say that while I'm thankful for the, the opportunities that technology gives us to minister to you, even when you're not here personally, it's just not the same. When Jesus designed his church, it's clear that he intended for us to, to worship together corporately, to come together in Christian community. So you can consider that your personal invitation to join us in person, Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, Wednesday nights. God bless you. Have a great day.